Hello everyone, welcome back. We're going to be covering um, more of the chapter 3 material from the textbook and getting into the chapter 5 material. Um, uh, that's my plan for today and I'm going to pick it up right kind of where we left off um, with the different things that we're going to be uh, looking for when we're doing this annotation step of our argumentative analysis which is paving the way for the standard form and diagramming part of the project that uh, is covered in chapter five. Um, so that's that's the kind of agenda for today. Before I get started on all this though, just a couple business things. Um, some of you have been asking about the uh, due date for the chapter three homework and because we're kind of smushing three and five together it's been a, I haven't been exactly sure like what day to put down for it. Um, and like we've talked about before, um, these due dates are very flexible given that this is an online class and my knowledge of uh, all of your situations and your schedules and, and all the kind of juggling that you're doing. Um, so nothing much falls down if you don't have um, the homework done by that exact due date. Uh, those think treat it as just kind of like strongly recommended. I, I put I set the due date for the chapter three homework. Uh, for Saturday, because um, we're going to be starting the Chapter 5 stuff today and then continuing with that. I may have a supplement video that I do over the weekend. We'll see how that goes, um, see how far we get today with it. Um, but I, I might keep things moving along that way. Um, but treat that as just kind of like a recommended thing, like having the homework done over the weekend is putting you on pace. Um, and also kind of along with that, uh, going back to the paper project that I talked about last weekend, um, that is like kind of open and assigned, but it has all these different stages to it. Um, after today, you'd be in a position, maybe through the weekend too, to get as far as the first couple steps of the paper project. So you're definitely in a position to just write the gosh darn thing, the 500 word argumentative essay. But then you'll be able to do the annotation step. Um, and I, like I said in my video over the weekend, I do recommend kind of doing this as we go. So once we get done here with the chapter three stuff on annotations, do that stage of the paper project, hold off on doing standard form and diagram till we get done with the chapter five lectures, um, and you do the chapter five homework to get some practice, and then you can finish it all up. Um, the exact date when the paper project is due is also kind of eh, like I, I think I set it for a week from tomorrow. So not this coming Friday, but the Friday after that. Um, again, that's kind of recommended. That'll land right about where, um, and actually I might open it up a little ahead of time of that, but where I'm going to open up exam one, where exam one will be available for you to take. And I'll, I'll give you a good chunk of time, probably like a whole week, um, to decide when you want to take that exam to make sure you've got time to prepare for it, to ask me questions, to check in with me about like homework problems and the paper project. I definitely recommend getting the paper, once, once you get through the chapter five material that you finish the paper project as early as possible so that we have the time to like talk about it. Because uh, given that the, the kind of due date for the assignment is right before when the exam is happening, um, there won't be the time for me to give you like substantive feedback as a part of grading it. Um, and that happens even when I teach this class not online. And my advice to students is always, uh, you know, it's there for practice for you. Um, and if you have any questions or concerns about it, about whether you're doing it in the right way or what's up with that, then um, you should check in with me and see uh, how it's going. And I can give you that kind of personalized feedback. Um, so uh, it's kind of back to this theme of, balls in your court to kind of self-advocate, but I'm really available and happy to talk to you um, and be as accessible as I possibly can with this. Some more of you have been contacting me uh, with, like, we've had some phone conversations going over how you're feeling about homework problems, and that's great. I'd love to hear from more of you, though, because it's really just been a handful of people who have um, been getting in touch with me and getting this kind of feedback and um, where I can help like round off some of the rough edges for you or explain some stuff in another way. Um, I was having a conversation with someone, I think it was yesterday, the days are all getting mixed up for me, I think it was yesterday, um, and we were just remarking about, or they remarked about something that's very familiar to me with this class, which is, you know, lectures, these lectures can be really helpful of me explaining the material and uh, 
helping cash it out for you from what the book was talking about. Um, but there's kind of uh, something special that happens when we're able to have dialogue about it. And like I've alluded to before, when I can give you like personalized advice about kind of where you're at with respect to this skill we're trying to master and what needs to be recalibrated in your particular case. Because what's happening for you will be different from some other student who's maybe fallen off the other end of the boat. And if I can kind of see how you're thinking about it, I can hear from you, then I can give you even better uh, advice and, and feedback about where you, where you need to go. Um, so usual stuff, I've talked about these kinds of themes before, but I just want to kind of put that back on your radar, back on your plate uh, to consider that and, um, and then to act on it and reach out to me. Um, I al you also have noticed that on the website, uh, on the Canvas site, I have already posted the answers for the Chapter 3-4 homework. Um, and that's going along with the promise that I gave. Um, here, just one second. Sorry about that. Um, so um, I've already posted the answers, and that's um, in line with the kind of promise I made the other day about uh, not gonna, I'm not going to police your access to the homework answers. And the main reason is that some of you are working at very different paces. Like some people want to be working ahead of schedule. Some of you are working behind schedule. Um, and for those of you who are working ahead of schedule, I don't want to be cutting you off from the resources that you need to, to put effort into the class. I don't want to artificially slow things down um, for you if you're trying to anticipate stuff down the road, which is really wise during summer quarter when things happen so fast anyway. So. Um, I've done that, but again, I recommend you know not taking a look at those answers until uh, you finish doing the homework on your own and and giving it a crack, like struggled with it on your own independently. That even if it seems like a struggle or feels like a struggle, that's productive stuff to like have to sort of figure stuff out on your own or at least make the attempt, and then to check in with me and with like you know whatever authority comes with my considered answers or my ability to explain things or uh, confirm or disconfirm whether you're doing something right or wrong. Okay, so with those preliminaries out of the way, let's go back here to lecture two. And the next thing that we're annotating for, which is, uh, well, I'm going to put this over here, um, guarding. So guarding is our next sort of argumentative maneuver that we're trying to um, be sensitive to and be listening for and be able to detect when people are doing it. Um, and uh, if you remember from the last video, we ended the lecture talking about validity. And validity is a pretty important concept for this unit. Um, and I, I'll, I'm gonna, this is something kind of relevant for the chapter five material, but let's, let's bring it up now especially in chapter five, when the book is talking about validity, it doesn't necessarily mean um, the technical notion of validity that we talked about last time. Do you remember I, I mentioned how validity is one of two standards, the other one being strength, inductive strength, that allows us to evaluate the support relation of an argument? Whether we're talking about validity or strength, the common theme is that there's something about the truth of the premises that has a bearing on the truth of the conclusion. That it, it gives me, the accepting the truth of the premises sort of moves me in the direction of accepting the conclusion. In the case of validity, that has to be like this airtight guarantee. With strength, it could be maybe just making the conclusion more probable, but it's not a guarantee, right? There's not that airtight connection. Um, listening for there being like a gap there um, in the case of validity just any possibility that the premises could be true and yet the conclusion is false means that there's a, a leap in logic taking place and being sensitive that's going to be very important for the chapter five stuff but it's also connected here with um, how we think about the strength and scope of the claims that we make when we're making arguments so keep that in the background here. Keep that idea on the back burner as we talk about this guarding phenomenon. Um, what is guarding? The definition we get from the book here is weakening claims so that they're less subject to attack. And the first thing I want to point out about understanding that idea is notice that it is by definition a conversational act. 
It's not, uh, it's not a speech act. Weakening claims, that would be a speech act. Putting caveats, um, extra conditions, um, things that, that m minimize the, how robust of a claim am I making? How big of a claim am I making? Uh, we'll define that a little bit more technically in a second. But to just weaken a claim or to, to qualify it, that's a, that could be a speech act. You don't have to be thinking about people's intentions or purposes or goals or motives to be able to see that that's happening. But the way this definition is going explicitly includes that attention to purpose. It says weakening claims for the purpose of them being less subject to attack. Like there's an intention behind the weakening. So it's not just weakening claims that's guarding. It's weakening them so that they're less subject to attack. Now, how would that work? Well, we talked about this a little bit last time with how, uh, with the theme of uh, burden of proof. So the stronger of a claim I make, the more I'm going to have to defend it. We talked about this with assuring. Remember exaggeration? Like if I make a stronger claim, I like step out and make a big exaggerated version of the claim I'm trying to make, then I'm painting a bigger target on myself. Uh, my claim is more potentially open to things like counterexamples and objections and things of that nature. So by weakening the claim instead of exaggerating it, I'm like presenting a smaller target. Okay. I, I told you I'd be using a bunch of martial metaphors for discussing uh, assuring, guarding, and discounting. And the, the martial metaphor here is like, imagine like a gun battle or something between two people. Um, if I'm going in like guns blazing like this, then like I've got a, I'm presenting a big target. It's going to be easier to hit me. But if I'm like crouched, you know, and, and down here, like I'm out of the camera here, but I'm a smaller target. It's harder to hit me if I'm, you know, minimizing my spatial presence, right? My visibility. So that's what's going on here with guarding. Um, how do we do this? Um, there's a few different continuums of strength for claims that are important to be tracking. Um, I already talked about, I mentioned the word scope, and this is one of the biggest ones. Um, so if I put a qualifier into the claim that puts like a condition on it, I'm saying I'm not talking about everything here, I'm just talking about things in this narrow band. Like the, in my lecture notes here, I call it the intended extent of the claim. Like the subject of the claim is being restricted. So for example, I might make, I want, I might want to make a claim about all humans, and that would be pretty big. Um, but I could make even a bigger claim. I could talk about like all sentient beings uh, or something like that. It might include non-human animals or aliens or stuff like that. Um, or I could like start restricting it and be like, well, I don't know about all humans, but maybe like all Americans. Like that would be to put some more qualification. Or I could be like all students or all Bellevue College students or all online students. I mean, all those little caveats start restricting the scope of what my claim is addressing, the subject of my claim, that I'm making a claim about those things. I'm saying these things have a property or uh, there's something true of them. Okay, So that's one way that I can guard my claims is restricting their scope. Um, I say in the lecture notes, retreating from all to most or to a few. That's also a way that you can do it. So I'm not making even an, a claim about everything that's in the subject area, but maybe just saying most of them, right? Um, some is actually one of the weakest things. When we break down the qualifier uh, some uh, in logic, it, it's something we call the existential quantifier. Don't worry about that right now. I might talk about that when we get to formal logic, but not at the moment. Um, but the, the basic idea of it is basically at least one. Some just means at least one. Um, most is getting a little stronger there, and that versus something like all, or almost all, and then all. Um, that's getting progressively stronger. So that's one way we can guard claims, um, is restrict their scope. Another way we can do it is about introducing probability phrases. Um, and this gets into a little bit of logic. I'm not going to go too deep down this rabbit hole, and don't, don't worry so much about the details here, but... Um, there's uh, a, as a, as a part of formal logic, there's something called modal logic. And modal logic is really fun. Um, 
Actually, I'm going to break out my whiteboard here um, on Microsoft Paint. Well, no, I don't need to do that. I don't want to make this into that big of a deal. So in Logic, we like to abstract the claims that we're making in order to just see their form. So we take the kind of content out to just see the form of reasoning um, rather than necessarily what it's talking about. It's a very specific type of rational analysis here. Um, so we might symbolize uh, just any claim someone might want to make as a single letter. We'll be doing this after the first exam uh, in earnest. Um, but we might symbolize it as P. Uh, logicians usually choose P that stands for proposition. A proposition is just a claim, saying something is true. So take P. The content of P will stay exactly the same, but we can put little modifiers on it that change uh, how that claim sort of ends up behaving or like how big of a claim it might be making. Um, this, the normal sort of standard way in which we make claims is we say something is actually true. So if I just state P, I'm saying P is actually true. But in a way where it could be contingently true. Like it happens to be true, but it didn't have to be that way. Like uh, Donald Trump is our president. That's a fact. That, that proposition is actually true. But it's a contingent truth. It depended on how people voted. If they had voted a different way, we'd have a different president. And that's the contrast saying something is actually true with something that's a little stronger than that of what's necessarily true. In modal logic, we symbolize that kind of uh, modal operator as a box. So you might have uh, like this little square, box P. Box P is saying P is necessarily true. And what it means to say that something is necessarily true is that it is impossible for it to be false. And the sense of possibility you should be thinking about here that logicians intend is the same notion of possibility we use to describe validity, logical possibility. And you remember, when you're thinking about like logically possible counterexamples to an argument's validity, I mean, you're not restricted to the realm of plausibility. It doesn't have to be consistent with the laws of nature. It just can't involve a contradiction. So to say that it is logically impossible for the claim to be false is a really big deal claim. It's like, no matter how the world the contingent facts of the universe worked out, here's something that would have, that is true no matter what. Um, if you've studied any philosophy before, maybe then it would make sense for me to say a lot of the, the subject matter in which we discuss necessary truth is metaphysics. Like what are those aspects of reality that are not contingent? Um, that no matter how, like you imagine, like alternate parallel universes where the facts work out differently, what would still be true in that universe? That's going to be the domain of necessary truth. So that's a really, really strong claim. We can't say very many things are necessarily true. Maybe something like mathematical truths are necessarily true because even if you went to some alternate universe, like it's not like math is a contingent fact about the world. That. Uh, <clears throat> if the world was different, then 2 plus 2 would not equal 4. Like, that's not the case. So uh, there might be some things that are necessary truths, but that's pretty hard to shoulder burden of proof on that. Going down from that, so we got necessary truth at the top. Actual but contingent truth is a little weaker than that. Even weaker than that is saying something is possibly true. And in modal logic, we symbolize this with a diamond. So you might say diamond P is to say something is possibly true. I mean, what you have to do to prove that something is possibly true is not a lot. It doesn't take much to shoulder that burden of proof, especially if we're talking about logical possibility here. All you got to do is demonstrate it doesn't involve a contradiction. That's it. That doesn't take much. To prove that a possibility is what's actually true, that takes a little bit more. You got to have some evidence, probably some contingent evidence. That means, you know, like empirical observation or something like that to show that this possibility is how things actually are. That increases your burden of proof. That's a little bit stronger of a claim. And then if you say necessarily true, well, good luck making a proof for that. <laughs> That'll be tough to do. Kind of in between possibility and actuality is probability. So if I say something is probably true, I'm not quite committing to it as being actually the case, um, just that its probability is uh, greater than zero 
um, or maybe on the upper end, close to one, if, you, if you've done any probability theory, um, studied that maybe in math class or something like that. Um, we're not saying it was certainty, but something a little less than that. But it's definitely um, stronger. To say something is probably true is definitely stronger than saying that it's just possibly true. That's really, really thin. There's some really cool things that happen with modal logic. Um, again, this isn't a major part of the curriculum, but um, just as a kind of fun demonstration of what logicians can do with these devices like box P, regular old P, and then diamond P, there, there are axioms that allow you to draw inferences from some of these forms of claims to others. Like, for example, here, here's just the most straightforward basic one. And it was kind of part of the way I defined uh, um, necessity a second ago. So if something is necessarily true, then that means it's not possible to be false. Um, I'm, we're going to get into more of the symbols of logic when we and the like symbol language that we use for that when we do chapter six after exam one. But as a little bit of foreshadowing here, we have a symbol that's like a tilde. It's like a squiggle. Beep. And the tilde means not. It's a negation of something. So box P is the same as tilde diamond tilde P. Not possible for P to be not true, a.k.a. it's false. And the flip side of that, to say that something is possibly true, diamond P, is actually the exact same meaning as saying not necessarily not true tilde box tilde p is the same as diamond p. So there's some kind of cool things we can do with those rules as a part of making arguments and drawing inferences and recognizing what is logically entailed from one claim to another. That is a little bit of a tangent. Um, like I said, that's not on the exam. You're not going to be responsible for that. It's just kind of a fun thing I want to let you know about. If you want to ask me about it more some other time, feel free. Um, but these modal operators are another continuum of strength that we might use as a part of this guarding phenomenon. A way we can take a claim and make it weaker than it otherwise would be. Um, the strongest thing is saying something necessarily true, then that it's actually true, then that it's probably true, then that it's just possibly true. That's decreasing in strength there. The final um, sort of continuum of claims being stronger and weaker that we're going to talk about is our attitudes toward the beliefs that we have. Um, not about the beliefs themselves. The first two categories have been all about the sort of logical and conceptual content to a claim. But this last one is about our relationship with that claim. Um, the world of logic that studies this is called dostastic, doxastic logic. D-O-X-A-S-T-I-C logic. Doxastic logic. It's very fascinating. Because it's sort of a combination of conceptual analysis, logical analysis, and some things about like psychology get in there too. Um, but uh, one of the, the cool things that doxastic logic sort of reveals is that our attitudes about propositions is not as simple as believing it or not believing it. There's actually a bunch of subtle different colors between those black and white possibilities here of the way that we could relate. And some of that, uh, we're not going to go into like the real deep ends of that rabbit hole here, but here's just kind of a superficial level that you could be tracking as a part of thinking about guarding. So imagine I say, I know that something is true. That's a pretty strong, strong thing to say. If there's a pattern here between these different continuums of strength I've been talking about, the scope or extent of the claim, these uh, modal things, and now this doxastic attitudes are our level of commitment to the claim. The common thread here is that the stronger a claim, the more burden of proof it takes to defend it. The weaker the claim, the less you have to do in order to adequately, rationally justify believing in it. So, or, or having that attitude or that relationship, accepting that claim. Um, so in this last category, you can kind of think about why, why is it strong to say that I know something? Well, that's strong because I have to do a lot more to defend that it's reasonable for me to claim that I know it. N knowledge is actually a really robust phenomenon. This is one of the main areas that philosophers get into. Again, I'm not going to go down a huge tangent here, but this is the field of epistemology. 
And it's one of the sort of big three questions that philosophers consider and study. Uh, people specialize in this and like just spend their whole careers working on epistemology. And there's a lot of controversy about this. Um, I've, I've mentioned how a lot of what happens in epistemology is controversial. But there, there's a kind of, uh, I'll just call it like a mainstream or traditional view about what knowledge is. And the basic idea, the formula here is that knowledge is justified true belief. So you have to form a belief about how things are. You have to commit to something. It has to be actually and objectively true. And you have to be justified in it. And those first two things probably sound really obvious. But why, what do we need this justification thing for? A lot of the devil is in the details of how you cash out justification here for whether something counts as knowledge or not. But the main reason <clears throat> is to prevent lucky knowledge. If I, like flip a coin and then make a prediction about the next election outcome based on that coin flip and then it turns out that my belief is true that doesn't mean I knew it was going to happen just the fact that I have a true belief doesn't seem to be sufficient to claim it as being knowledge and there's a whole lot of philosophical arguments to justify that line of reasoning that I just offered but that's a common uh, approach to understanding knowledge that a lot of philosophers are compelled by that I don't get I don't get knowledge out of luck Right? It might be lucky that I encountered the evidence that justified me in believing something and, and gaining a knowledge, but the knowledge itself can't be lucky. Okay? But justification is the real tricky uh, variable in that formula of like what is adequate justification. But the bottom line is that how most epistemologists end up looking at this, knowledge claims are usually pretty stringent. This is this is a big claim. It's uh, You might say it's audacious to claim that you know something. <clears throat> it's definitely something weaker to say it's reasonable for me to have a belief, okay, and not count it as complete knowledge. Knowledge is more robust than reasonable belief. Kind of, um, <clears throat> I've been saying this stuff. Oh, we, we, oh no, we talked about it in the Code of Intellectual Conduct. Remember I was saying... Um, with the st the, the uh, procedural standard from the Code of Intellectual Conduct, you know, the best thing that we'd like to get is the truth. We'd love to get at the truth. We'd like to know the truth. But that's pretty hard to do in a lot of cases that we could justify that kind of confidence about it. And so the next best thing, something that's a little weaker and maybe more within our grasp, is just figuring out what's the most rationally defensible position. And that's kind of like this level of commitment of belief that, well, for now, everything I got justifies me in believing this. I don't necessarily going to say I know it, but it's a reasonable belief. That has less of a burden of proof. It's, it's a little more, you know, backing off. It's not as ag aggressive or assertive of a claim. It's kind of backing down a little bit. You know, it's a little qualifier. And you could go even less than that to say, like, it's reasonable for me to suspect something. Right? Not that I'm like, I believe it. I'm just like, yeah, I kind of think, think that might be true. What is reasonable grounds for suspicion is weaker than the reasonable grounds for belief, which is weaker than the reasonable grounds for a knowledge claim. And that's, that's kind of the idea here. So uh, we could talk about kind of the standards of accountability for how appropriate is it for me to adopt a certain level of commitment to my claim. That's another reason why uh, assuring kind of works out the way that it does. That the stronger I posture in terms of my level of conviction and commitment to a belief, that implies that I must have even more good reason for that. Because it's a more vulnerable thing, right? I would need a higher burden of proof to be justified in adopting that attitude toward that proposition. Um, so that's what's going on there. Um, I do. Someone showed up in the chat. Neil showed up. Thank you for coming. Um, do you? Uh, I want to use you again. I'm going to exploit your presence. How am I? Do, how, how are things going so far with my description of just the guarding phenomenon and, and these different ways in which we actually do it? What you can be listening for to pick up on guarding. Hey Tim, uh, I guess just uh, listening for the probability phrases. Just 
some of the stuff I was kind of referring to in tracking on some of the um, I'm not even reading some of the chapter five material. So man, so I was trying to jump back and forth on there. I jumped in about fifteen minutes ago. And oh okay. It was kind of was in the middle of it. Okay. But um. Yeah, I'm getting that the guarding. Uh, the general gist of it. Yeah. And yeah, and that, that, that general gist is, is mostly you, what you can kind of listen for even if you're not thinking, you're not calibrated in so detailed a way as like looking for these particular mechanisms that I just went through in the lecture. But you can kind of just listen for someone like backing off, right? Like not, not going so strong, but, but kind of minimizing their claim in one way or another. Um, oftentimes you can kind of your intuition will pick up on that, and then you want to go and find the language that's responsible for doing that. Um, maybe though the the list of these sorts of three continuums of strength, the way claims can be stronger and weaker, gives you something a little bit more detailed to be listening for, just to kind of double check things too. Um, on this point though, about uh, like hearing, like intuitively listening for the guarding phenomenon, there is some there is a natural difficulty about this that just kind of has to be acknowledged, which is, which is this, the purpose part. Remember the definition says weakening a claim to make that claim less subject to attack. So it's, it's guarding is weakening claims for that specific purpose. And that would be most obvious in like a dialogue or a discussion. Like let's say Neil, you and I are having a conversation and I make a claim. I'm like, well, I think this is true. Right? I make a thesis. Uh, I, this is my stance. This is my position. And then you start throwing some objections at me, and I'm like, oh, oh yeah, that now that's a good that's a good point that you're making there, Neil. Um, I'm gonna back down a little bit. Okay, so yeah, you're right. If I was saying this big thing, I would be vulnerable to that objection. But you know, I think I'm gonna qualify my position. I'm just gonna say this, and then that part that you were criticizing, I don't have to worry about. I'm I'm I abandon my commitment to that piece of it. If I make my claim weaker, maybe I can avoid that objection. Here's a really classic example, especially for Americans and our love of exaggeration. Someone comes up and says, you know, everyone does this. And then someone's like, well, what about this person? They don't do that. And they're like, oh, okay, yeah, that's right. Okay, most people do this, right? Because if you're going to say all, then all it takes is one counterexample to disprove your statement as being false. But so you just make that little qualification, and now you're no longer subject to that objection. Boom. So if that happened in a dialogue, it'd be pretty obvious what I'm doing. I'm taking a claim I previously asserted and weakening it to avoid an objection, to make it less subject to attack. Most times, you're not going to have that luxury, that where it's going to just slap you in the face like that, that that's what's happening. People preemptively qualify their claims anticipating possible objections that maybe are never even stated explicitly. And that's where it's tricky to listen for this. So here's my here's the Tim Lineman advice about how to think about guarding, how to do the actual annotations for this, and how to double check your answers. My advice is it's a two-step process. First, you want to listen for just the weakening stuff, for a caveat that's thrown in there, like probably, or some or whatever that is those kind of mechanistic aspects that I was talking about and and the way you can double check it is um, if you think that this word or phrase is weakening the claim see if you can imagine a stronger version of the claim that they could have said instead so that's step one of double checking your answer that's just getting the weakening part of the definition what about the purpose part the way in which this is a conversational act the second question to ask yourself to double check here before you mark that as guarding is once if you're able to say oh yeah there is a stronger version of this claim they could have said instead ask yourself do I think that person is interested or motivated in making the stronger claim like would they want to make that stronger claim if they thought they could get away with it as opposed to maybe they don't think they can get away with it so they're gonna go with the weaker claim instead that's the way that you can kinda do an acid test of what you want to or you're sort of feeling like I, yeah I want to mark this as guarding you want to always do that two-step checkup on it is there a stronger version of the claim that they could have said instead and then do I think do I judge based on background assumptions or whatever you context everything 
that the speaker would have liked to make the stronger claim if they thought they could back it up with evidence. They'd have some motivation to do so. So take, for example, uh, I'll give you a scenario, an illustration of this. Um, and maybe I'll even pull up a, a homework problem here, too, as an example. Um, let's say I want to claim something about human nature, like big philosophy idea. And then I, I put the caveat in there of like, well, it's just my experience, but P, right, the proposition, this statement about human nature, just my experience. That puts a little qualifier on there. There's that little caveat, right? Um, I'm like backing off on this of just being like, well, maybe I could be wrong about this. Or it's like an acknowledgement of fallibility about this. I'm not saying it's definitely true. It's like, well, in my experience, this is true. Um, would I want to make the stronger claim? In mo you know, nine out of ten times in that context, yeah, I, I would be interested in saying, you know, this is how na human nature is. And it's not just a, a matter of like what's been exposed to me in my experience. I think maybe my experience is giving me evidence that grounds me in making a judgment about cases that are I haven't had experience with. Like I can generalize the claim, right? Might want to do that. But I just uh, I'm not I'm not sure I've got the evidence to really make that strong of a claim. So instead I make a, a slightly weaker one. So contrast that scenario with this scenario. Let's say the topic of conversation is just like us having a personal conversation and you're trying to get to know me. And I'm like, well, in my experience, this kind of stuff is true. Now, there's really not a conversational purpose for why I'd want to say anything about anyone else's experience or what's going on outside of it. Because the whole point of the conversation is just to get to know me and my perspective, right? Of like, what's your story, Tim? You know, that kind of thing. So that wouldn't be guarding if I said, well, in my experience, blah, blah, blah. Because I, it's weaker than if I said a general statement, but I have no motive to make a general statement given that cooperative purpose for the conversation. Neil, is that making sense to you? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right, so, so that's all this stuff about how guarding works. Um, let's talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly with this. So when is this great? When is it bad? Um, so the, the bottom line here, and this is where the validity concept is going to come back. Guarding is really good. Um, it's absolutely appropriate um, on the grounds of not claiming more than I need to. And the book talks explicitly about, actually, I'm just going to pull this back up so you can look at me. I don't need my lecture notes. Um, the book talks about how um, if I've got a conclusion and I'm trying to back it up with premises, I have a burden of proof to shoulder to try to justify this conclusion then I don't want to go overboard with my premises. I only want to claim what I need to shoulder the burden of proof for the conclusion. If I make stronger claims than I have to, like I exaggerate, then there's a danger in getting a distorted picture of what's actually involved with the debate around this conclusion. This is one of the things that drives me up the wall about political discourse, especially public political discourse a lot of the times, is that people go way more extreme than they have to to give the argument or make the case for a certain type of conclusion. They go overboard. And then other people are like, man, that's overboard. Yeah, I'm not down with this conclusion at all. This doesn't make sense. When it's like, maybe they do have good reason to believe that conclusion. They just didn't need to go as far as they did with it to do this overkill thing. So to guard our premises is a way we can make not only our arguments stronger, to make them less subject to attack, but also that it's kind of more honest to the debate territory that we're trying to address and analyze. Like, what's actually going on with the conclusion? How controversial is this conclusion? If I'm giving super controversial, massive claims to justify it, that makes it look like it's on more tenuous ground than it actually is. So that's one really, really good thing about guarding, when we're talking about guarding the premises. I need them to be strong enough to shoulder the burden of proof to justify the conclusion, but I don't want them to be stronger than that. It's a kind of Goldilocks principle here. Not too weak, not too strong. And the nice thing about guarding, figuring out how to appropriately guard your premises is that the conclusion kind of sets the bar for you. Like I need premises that will rationally justify this conclusion. 
but they don't have extra information or extra strength more than is needed to justify that conclusion. The conclusion kind of sets, sets the bar, so that's nice. Something the book doesn't talk about, uh, or not to my satisfaction, is the, the skill and art and usefulness of guarding conclusions. So when we're talking about guarding premises, there's a nice clear bar set that's based on the conclusion that you're trying to justify. In the case of guarding a conclusion, that has to be set by something different. The argument itself won't tell you. Um, but one big factor here might just be, well, what evidence do you have to claim? And make sure you make a conclusion that is as strong as possible without kind of overstepping the grounds of what your evidence can prove. That's, that's a kind of really straightforward way of talking about it. But the bigger one here is theoretical motivations. Why does it matter to make the defense of this conclusion? Why do you care to, to defend this, this castle, right? To uh, defend this position? Um, what is the point? And I like this because sometimes I think we just get distracted with rationalizing certain beliefs and forget about like, why do I care about defending this belief? What is it good for? Putting it in a kind of broader context. Especially if you want to go on and study more philosophy that require, I think philosophy requires a lot of vision, so to speak. Um, like looking at the big picture and being able to track um, the reason that like big paradigms or positions, kind of almost like different cultures when they like clash on something. Like how are you going to resolve those rational controversies? Making it really clear like if you're going to present a theory about something like what's the purpose of it? Why, why do we want a theory? Like why does it matter? Why would it be justified for us exerting all this critical effort and work in trying to sort out whether this claim is true or false? Sometimes it doesn't matter. Um, and even in the case when it does clearly matter, being able to articulate why it matters is really helpful in navigating the debate that will ensue, that will follow from there. And evaluating like how ambitious you know, how big of a bite do I want to bite off to chew on and try to justify? I'm working right now with my 101 students on writing an original philosophy paper. I allude to this every once in a while in these lectures. Um, but we had a big, big lecture about how to write philosophy papers today. And there's a real art and skill with making sure that when you're settling on a thesis for a paper, basically a conclusion of an argument, like how ambitious are you going to get? Uh, how what is you, you want it to be strong enough that you're not saying something trivial that's a big thing but not so outrageous that you'll never be able to adequately defend it in the space of the paper you know that you've got to write um, that's why uh, some positions can be written as papers you know like a 15 to 20 page paper other things are dissertations or books you know they require much more space in order to defend that thesis because it's making a much stronger claim. So don't, uh, even though the book does, kind of glosses over this, I just want to put that on your radar that there, there is an art to picking out the right strength of the conclusion that you care to defend too. Sometimes when we think about why we care to defend a conclusion, we sometimes realize that there's a weaker version of the conclusion and that's, that's good enough. Like that's, that captures everything that I really care to defend, and I don't need to take a more outrageous position than than that, right? Um, so I think that's that's worth critical reflection on too, um, especially if I'm right about this generalization about American culture and our tendency for exaggeration. Um, recognizing where exaggeration is happening, where needless exaggeration is occurring, um, is is a useful skill to have, I think. In terms of the bad. How can things go wrong with guarding? Well, I just kind of talked about a couple of them. If I guard my conclusions too much, they become trivial, and then like, what's the point? Right? Then it's just something too obvious, or it, it's not it's not going to make a big difference to accept that claim versus rejecting it. If the more it's guarded, the weaker it's not saying as much, right? Uh, not as ambitious. If I'm guarding my premises, the major danger is that they're no longer strong enough to defend my conclusion. They, they can't, they're not strong enough to shoulder the burden of proof for the conclusion. So that's the big danger with guarding too much. And maybe you met people like this, that when you start throwing objections at them, they just start shaving off more and more of their position. Okay, yeah, well, I'm not saying that, I'm just, I'm just saying this, you know. 
I'm just saying this. I'm just saying this. I'm just saying this. I'm just saying and I'm getting stuck. And it's so trivial it doesn't matter anymore. Um, so that's a big danger there too. Um, so uh, there's a, and, and then there's another thing that we should talk about too, another phenomenon here. But that, that's always like, guarding is a really effective way of responding to criticism, but it, com it always comes with a cost. Right? You're giving up on something when you do that. You're, you're shaving off more of what you're trying to say. And some stuff, maybe like when I was talking about exaggeration, some stuff can be cut off, and yeah, that's not important. But then it starts getting a little closer to the quick, and now it's starting to lose like something of great meaning. Some of you might be thinking about slippery slope arguments here as like a concern. Um, and that, that's slippery slope arguments sometimes get abused now we think about them. They're, they're, not, they're, they're not quite as scary as sometimes people make them out to be. Slippery slopes are kind of like the boogeyman of informal logic in a lot of people's minds, I think. Sort of an inappropriate fear of them. Um, because the real answer is you just draw a principled line. And there's a couple ways to do that. To say, yep, I can't cut these premises down anymore because then I would lose justification for the conclusion. Or to be, be able to identify the theoretical motives that are at stake with defending the conclusion. That if I like give up on this aspect of the position, then I'm kind of gutting what matters most about it being true. And to be able to articulate that is a way to block against that slippery slope there. Okay. Um, let's let's go back to the lecture notes to see what am I forgetting about. There's a I remember one thing here. Um, oh yeah yeah yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I should talk about that a little bit. Okay, that's right. All right, a couple more phenomenon that I want to talk about um, with guarding before we leave it behind here. Um, oop, come on, there we go. Um, oh, wait, Neil's got a question here. If you retreat significantly during an argument, is that in itself that something that could be seen as a vulnerability? Oh, I maybe I, I think I have an idea what you're going for here. Um, okay, a little bit more about American culture. <laughs> um, so there's uh, throughout the throughout all of American cultural history post-colonialism, um, there's been a kind of anti-intellectualism that's always been a part of. I think a lot of people's um, sort of American mindset um, that someone that we start to get distrustful of someone who's throwing too many caveats and qualifiers and is being too intellectually sophisticated or theoretically sophisticated with their position this kind of like lawyer talk um, and I think that's part of the the sort of cultural rationalization for exaggeration that someone is like just wears their heart on their sleeve and like, I don't care what anyone thinks of me like wow that's what I think is true it's like, okay, well, you know exactly where that person stands, right? But you actually don't because you don't know, like, how much they're exaggerating what they really actually are committed to and how much this extra scope is, like, not really what they mean. Um, so the may, maybe just try to answer your question a little bit, Neil. Let me know if I'm barking up the wrong tree with what you're interested in here. But if you start throwing a lot of caveats in, at least to an American audience, there's that danger that there that there's a rhetorical effect here that they kind of treat you as less sincere, or that you are uh, wishy-washy, uh, or that you lack conviction. I don't think that those are fair responses to someone being careful in what they think, um, to be critical reasoners. I I, I think it's a it's a un, it's an irrational bias. Um, that those kinds of moves are heard that way or interpreted as having that kind of meaning behind them. Um, I don't think that that's right. But it is, I mean, if you're asking about a risk, like, yeah, that's a risk in terms of, like, knowing your audience. Um, uh, Americans have a tendency for this, and in a way that it doesn't matter wh where they're at on the, like, political spectrum or, you know, that kind of thing. It, it's something I've noticed kind of show up a lot um, across a lot of different subcultures of America. Um, and again, America is a very diverse and complex cultural landscape. I mean, it's lots of different cultures and communities and perspectives 
but in terms of like mainstream American culture, if I can use that and talk in broad generalities here, there is, I think that force is present. It's in the mix. Um, am I getting at what you're wondering about, Neil? Yeah. You know, there, there's another connection here, too. I should probably have my hat turned for all this, by the way, anyway, because this is just my sensitivity or exposure experience with American culture. But, you know, there's a similar thing going on with, with this American anti-intellectualism where Americans are suspicious of people who change their mind, where it's like, Normally, that you want people to change their mind when they're wrong, <laughs> you know, or there's a more rationally defensible position that's been presented to them. You'd want them to be responsive to it, but we're sort of like distrustful of that a lot of the times too. They're like, so if you have a position and then someone presents an objection, you're like, oh man, you're right. Yeah, I guess I'm going to give that up. Okay, I abandon that. Then they're like, whoa, this person doesn't have any convictions. Um, you know, I they. They're, they're wishy-washy, you know, they don't stand for anything. Um, they don't have this, this kind of virtue of character, uh, of like knowing what they believe and sticking with it kind of thing. We like almost prefer dogmatism over open-mindedness as a character trait, <laughs> of a virtuous character trait. Again, not universally, but I definitely have encountered that, that kind of uh, cultural sentiment. Um, so if you're if you do guard as a response to an objection, people are like, oh, man, I don't have respect for this person because they they didn't fight back, right? Um, they just sort of accepted that criticism. But any, anyway, that that's not super important. That's all contingent cultural stuff, too. That's not about universal principles of logic or reasoning here. Um, but again, kind of part of maybe knowing your audience is the only risk here. I don't think that there's, I don't think there's any danger on this front when it comes to just rational standards and fulfilling the objectives of what we're trying to do as truth seekers here where there are dangers on that level though there's there's well there's one big one here um, and it's connected with what the book calls hedging so a lot of let's think back to those standards of a good argument all true premises actually true premises and a good support relation let's talk in terms of validity for now we'll use the validity standard since we talked about it last time and it's a little more straightforward or clear-cut um, so I've got an argument I'm making, and I'll get objections on both fronts. Uh, there'll be possible objections coming to disputing the truth of my premises. There'll be other objections that are basically trying to show how my conclusion doesn't follow from my premises, or my premises are not sufficient in strength to be able to justify the conclusion. Now those, remember we talked about how those two standards of a good argument are requiring you to look at the argument in two very different directions. One of them is about what's actually true. The other one's just about what's possibly true, and that's it. Oh, okay. One second here. All right, so uh, these two different standards of what makes for a good argument require two very different forms of thinking, two angles. And there's no way to do them simultaneously, because one's about what's actual, the other one's about what's possible. So when I'm thinking about defending my argument from these two possible sources of objections, I gotta operate on two different modes, and it's really easy to kind of do a bait and switch tactic here, where when I'm dealing with the objections to my argument that challenge the truth of the premises, I guard them. I weaken those claims to dodge those objections. Um, but then when it comes to the objections that my premises are not strong enough to defend my conclusion, that the that it's not a valid argument, um, that the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises that I've offered. I use them in their unguarded version because then they're contributing more to defending the conclusion, right? Now that is what we call equivocation. I'm treating those two versions of the claims as being the same when they're different. I mean, if I'm guarding it here, I can't treat it, I can't use it as unguarded over here. I'm going to have to pick a version of those claims and run with it and have that be the argument I'm offering. Um, if this is done deliberately, as like a, 
a way to try to dodge criticism, then that's what I put in the ugly category of this good, the bad, and the ugly. That's an abusive manipulation um, as a part of an, a rational argument. But sometimes this can happen just accidentally. Um, when I've, I see even professional philosophers guilty of this in their arguments, especially when they're working on a book, and there, there's like a core theory or a core argument that the whole book is, is presenting and defending, and they have like different chapters dealing with different sources of objections. Sometimes they can forget about how it's like guarded here and not guarded there, and they're using it inconsistently, um, using the different versions of those claims inconsistently over the course of a book. Um, so sometimes we make those mistakes even when we're trying not to do, not to fall into that trap. Um, but that's something to be on guard against is another thing that can go wrong here when it comes to uh, guarding. Um, the other one last phenomenon, I won't say too much about this, but there's a technique that I think is sometimes helpful. If you've got a position that you're going to have a discussion with someone else about, and you know that they're already predisposed against that position, and they may have biases against it, so it's going to be hard for them to really have an open-minded conversation about it, uh, personally, I think about some of the uh, arguments and debates I had with my parents about some of my lifestyle choices when I was in college, et cetera, et cetera, as I'm growing up into an adult, and we have different values about things, and there's some things that I, I, I never was the kid who wanted to be like, I'm just going to do this secretly and not let my parents know about it so they think fine of me or something like that. I'm like, I want them to know me. I want them to have an actual relationship with me. So uh, I was honest about all this stuff, and I'm like, you want to debate it? If you got concerns, I'm willing to listen to them, and I'll tell you the reasons why I want to do things this way, what I think is good about it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, but those were sometimes hard conversations. And I'd sometimes use a guarding mechanism as a way to try to help them to be able to participate rationally and with an open mind with the perspective I was offering, rather than just like dismissing it out of hand right away. And it's to do this. Start with the most guarded version of your position that you can imagine, like the thinnest possible claim, and then ask your conversational partner of, of like, do you agree with me here? I mean, does this make sense to you? Like, would you accept this? And then slowly get it stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger until it goes to the full position that you're interested in defending. Um, this can be uh, really, really helpful and useful. Um, the, probably the biggest thing of why it's helpful is locating where, where the disagreement is. Because you give them the big version, and they're like, I hate that. And you give them the really small version, and they're like, I'm okay with that. Then you're like, okay, at what, at what point did a line get crossed for that other person where they're like, that, see, that's where I get off the train, right? That's where I get off the boat. That'll, that's really helpful for figuring out how to focus what to spend your time and energy in the debate discussing, like to identify what is the rational controversy that stands in need of resolution. Um, so that's helpful. The big danger with this strategy is that someone can feel like you're manipulating them, that it, it is um, like trying to cook the lobster, right? You put the lobster into the water cold while it's, it's still alive, and then you slowly turn up the heat, and then it, cook, it cooks, right? If you just threw it into the hot water, it'd thrash around, and, you know, it'd be a mess, but you do it slowly, and you acclimate them to it. And so if you're, I always say, like, this is, a, this is a fine strategy. Sometimes it helps to just be upfront about what you're doing. Like, I want to locate where our controversy is, where our disagreement is, so I'm going to do this. Here's how it's going to look. Here's my strategy, right? Just be upfront. Um, but the other advice I have is that as soon as you catch a sense that your opponent is getting, or that your conversational partner is, is getting suspicious of your goodwill, because goodwill and sincerity matter so much for having positive, productive, cooperative, truth-seeking debates, then I, I'd like just throw all your cards on the table and be like, okay, here's, here's what I really think, and now let's go from there. Um, but I think there's some usefulness to that strategy. So, wow, I uh, ended up spending a lot of time talking about guarding, far more than I was planning to. So let's see if I can be uh, a little more efficient with talking about our next two items, um, discounting and evaluative terms. Um, but that's uh, that's what I got for you for guarding. Neil, do you have any leftover questions about guarding? No. Okay. Cool. Um, I think I want to take just a short break before I dive into the rest of this. So um, let's do that.
All right, getting back into it here. So discounting is the last of these kind of three maneuvers that really qualifies like moves in the game of the debate that it, that we want to discuss here for the annotation project. Um, and let's let's go to the definition here to start. So discounting is defined by the book as anticipating criticisms and dismissing them. And right off the bat, this might sound bad. <laughs> like, and so I'll talk a lot about that here, or at least a little bit, about why this is a good thing to do. But um, there's two basic ways that we can do this. Hmm. Actually, let me say something else first. This is kind of like assuring. Discounting is kind of like assuring because to dismiss an objection or criticism is not the same as to respond to it. So if someone brings up a criticism and then I have an answer, like I'm like, here's why that objection fails, or here's why my argument survives that objection, why it's still rationally defensible, or this isn't a, a, this is just a flesh wound, not a fatal wound to my position or my argument. Um, that's not to dismiss the objection. That's to take it seriously and to, to just give the argument. So if someone doesn't accept the criticism that you offer, it doesn't mean they're disrespecting you. In the same way that if someone criticizes a positive argument that you're giving, gives you an objection, that doesn't mean they're disrespecting it either. They're like in the sense of respect that we talked about before, it's like taking it seriously. Um, this is something different. This is like rejecting the criticism without argument like how assuring is indicating I have backup reasons but not actually providing them. So the thing to listen for here is really someone being sensitive to a possible objection. So the way that you can double check your intuitive like listening for that phenomenon and picking it out and being like is discounting happening or not, the best way to double check this, is, your analysis, is to ask yourself the question, if I think this is discounting, what's the objection or potential objection that's being dismissed? And if you can't identify that, then there's probably not discounting going on. There should be some clue about what they're talking about that shows their sensitivity to something like that. Um, it might be done implicitly. It kind of might be done informally. It may not be super explicit, but you should be able to, to be able to pick up on or to extrapolate what is that objection that is being dismissed, okay? But it's still going to have that assuring type thing where the actual argument is left absent. So with assuring, I'm like, I'm thinking this is true, but I'm not telling you exactly why, right? I'm just indicating I have reasons for it, but I'm not giving them to you. Discounting is someone indicating, I think that objection fails without telling you why they think it fails or something like that. Now, in terms of how we do it, I mean, the first thing to say is just the, there are certain words and phrases that commonly do this. The biggest one is the word but. If I'm like, blah, 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 but, blah, 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 then that's that in itself is like acknowledging something and as in a possible objection but dismissing it I, I like these examples from the book where the book talks about um, the ring is expensive but beautiful or the ring is beautiful but expensive you know like there's an acknowledgement of some kind of consideration that's on the opposite side of what is well, in this case implicitly being defended like if someone said the ring is expensive but beautiful that's like, we should buy the ring, or the ring is should be bought because it's beautiful. Acknowledging that it's expensive would be a reason not to buy it, or vice versa with it being flipped, right? But words like but, however, nevertheless, those, those indicate discounting. Um, so you can listen for those things. Again, you got to be, you want to double check your answers here because just like I was talking about before, using the word bank strategy as a way to do these annotations is imperfect at best. Um, but there's, those are still clues. Uh, the word but very often does do this discounting work, so you can have that on your radar. Um, but in thinking about it more substantively here, there are, are two ways, two forms in which we might dismiss objections. And it actually pertains to the two standards for a good argument. Objections are themselves arguments. They just are, you know, whatever is the substance of the objection are like the premises for a conclusion that's saying something like, this position should be rejected, or this argument fails, or something like that. Sorry, there's a big truck going on in the background here. I'll wait for it to pass. So, one way that you might dismiss an objection is to say the claims that it is based on are false. 
or to say, yeah, those claims are true, but they're not sufficient to reject my position or my argument or, or my conclusion. So those are the two kind of ways, like the premises of the objection are false or the support relation that the objection is using to justify a conclusion of rejecting a principle or argument is weak. It's a weak support relation there. Um, notice that even doing those two things, which is a little more explicit than just being like, yeah, whatever, <laughs> to this objection, um, still don't cash out or give the full argument for why you think those claims in the objection are false or why you think the objection is insufficient in strength to pose a threat. Um, so, but you can kind of listen to those moves too. I've got, I've got some things here in the lecture notes. Like I say, if X was true, my premise would fail and so would my argument, but X is in fact false. That's not a full response to the objection. It needs to be, you need to be giving an argument to defend why you think that um, claim X is false. Or um, you can do something like, uh, yeah, I, that's a good point. You're making a good point there. I agree with that. However, I still think this is true. That's also going to be a discounting move too. Okay, so that's that's how it happens. Um, so like I mentioned, um, discounting itself, or let me check in here. Neil, um, is that description of discounting making sense to you? Just what it is and how to listen for it? Mm -hmm. Cool. Awesome. All right. So let's talk about the kind of good, bad, and the ugly with discounting. Um, so I think the biggest thing that has to be argued for is just how this is good at all. Because dismissing objections without argument could look like dogmatism, being closed-minded, like a refusal to engage with the opposing position. And that would be bad. So that that's the easy thing to define here. Like the bad use of discounting, or maybe we even say the abusive use of discounting, is basically as a refusal to shoulder burden of proof for your position, that you're not showing any charity to your opponent, um, an unwillingness to engage in critical debate at all, like close-mindedness, dogmatism, those are all bad things, and discounting maneuvers um, as speech and conversational acts can be used to do that, and that's inappropriate, ultimately. But where where is the space for it to be good? Um, a really easy... Uh, example of how discounting can be good is how um, it might just be for the sake of uh, practicality. So um, kind of like how I was describing assuring being okay, where it's like, yeah, if you want to go down this path, you're like saying to your conversational partner, you want to go down this path, like I can go there with you. I'm just not going to do it now. In the same way, you might be like going through your position and saying, here are my arguments, and, and there is this objection, but I think it's wrong, moving on to the next part, right? You can always come back to that later and, and give the more full-fledged response. It just might be a distraction to do it right now. Maybe you've had this experience where you're talking with someone, and you're like trying to share your perspective and give the arguments for it, and they keep cutting you off with like, well, what about this objection? And you're just like, cool your jets, like, I'll, I'll get there, like, we'll address that. Let me get this whole thing down first so you can see what I'm thinking, and then we can address those concerns or objections that you have. Um, maybe Have you had that experience, Neil? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, and it, when it keeps happening, right, you're like... I can't even get you know this complete argument out <laughs> to be able to see like the logic of how it's all supposed to hang together because there's these constant interruptions happening. Yeah. Well, and there is that. I mean, there's a concern about trivial objections too, and that's its own kind of problem. That's actually something that we have as an informal fallacy. We'll talk about at the end of the quarter. Um, yeah, trivial objections are are not rationally helpful most of the time um, th so it's a problem but uh, even if the objections were substantial it might be kind of just slowing down them getting the full picture it might be that some of those objections answer themselves when the person just sees everything that you've got to put on the table they see all the cards that you've got to play um, 
but it might still be useful to kind of indicate where that conversation could go to like flag it later to be like I'm sensitive I know that there's an opponent here people are going to challenge this you know this is a controversial claim let me get out my full argument though and then maybe we can return to that um, so that's a good use of discounting I think another good thing about doing that is that um, you're also you're using charity right you're you're not waiting for the opponent to bring up all the objections you're not um, being like here's what I say and it's accepted until you decide to challenge me on it or something like that you're basically handing weapons to your opponent if you're discounting objections because you're the one raising them bringing them up on putting them on the table um, so handing weapons to your opponent is one of the things I would described about how the principle of charity is like the soul of the code of intellectual conduct and sincere truth-seeking if someone just wants to win a fight they're not gonna throw they're not gonna give ammunition to their opponent um, someone who really wants to test ideas and see what makes the most sense what's the most rationally defensible position much less what's the truth does want to put the opponent in the conversation as robustly as they can um, and discounting is a step toward doing that it's kind of being honest about the weaknesses and vulnerability of your position that you do have burden of proof to shoulder and defend um, that's a kind of self accountability that helps with sincere truth seeking um, so that that's really the basics of the good of discounting and I can say some more here but I think for the sake of time I'm gonna move it along unless you've got some further questions Neil that you want to ask about discounting okay cool let me pause the video for just one second I'm gonna to need to find a way to get um, power to my computer okay so the last thing that we're trying to annotate for is uh, are these evaluative terms and we've we've talked about this phenomenon um, before in the class uh, when I've talked about how claims come in two flavors you've got descriptive claims and you have normative claims descriptive claims are just about what is the case whereas normative claims are about what's good and bad or right and wrong or appropriate or inappropriate or any any kind of evaluation of something um, that's that's the world of normativity evaluative claims are really just normative claims by a different name that's the phenomenon that we're trying to listen for here um, when is a speaker committing to something normative versus just making descriptive fact claims kinds of things um, and that's really important because of something I think we might have talked about before when I've talked about descriptive and normative claims which is something called the is ought gap this is a logical gap between is descriptive claims and ought normative claims if um, if something is the case that doesn't mean that it ought to be the case just because something happened didn't mean it was good and just because something is good doesn't mean it is gonna happen that's kinda like wishful thinking I think I described the other one as kind of like a perspective of fate you know like if it happened it meant it was meant to happen it was ideal or, or good for it to happen and that's not always the case at least that it's not a, a logical truth right sometimes there's a gap between those two things so this is anticipating a lot of the stuff we're going to be doing with chapter five and so it just kind of makes sense to be the last annotation for us to be talking about um, let me give you an example argument to illustrate what I want to talk about here um, let's say that um, my toddler uh, Luke is playing with his cousin and hits his cousin uh, which he actually does we've been working on this whole hitting behavior thing he's a rambunctious physical toddler and doesn't always respect people's personal space so I tell Luke he's verbal now so I could actually do this, this is like one of the first times I have used this example for a long time and now I can actually talk about it in all seriousness um, let's say I tell Luke um, it's it's wrong to hit your cousin and Luke asks me why why daddy and I say well hitting causes pain now we might buy that as a good argument like that's a good reason for thinking that hitting is wrong but it actually doesn't logically follow certainly not if we're thinking about this from the standpoint of like a standard of validity just because hitting causes pain a descriptive claim about how the world is that there's a causal link between those two states of affairs doesn't mean that it's wrong in fact this is evidenced by how he could you know kind of perfectly reasonable frame of mind say something like oh I know daddy that's why I hit him I hit him to cause him pain right that you can accept the truth of the premises 
without having to accept the truth of the conclusion. Now there's a hidden premise in there, and it's the premise that causing pain is wrong. So if you had premise one, causing pain is wrong, premise two, hitting causes pain, now you're in a position to draw the conclusion that uh, hitting is wrong. Okay? But it if we got a normative conclusion, the sort of rule of thumb here is that there has to be at least one normative premise. Descriptive premises all by themselves are insufficient to justify a normative conclusion. But you're only going to go looking for those, those hidden premises or sort of filling in the gaps of the argument or to recognize that it's not an adequate argument if we're not tracking where those normative claims are coming from. So that's why we're kind of tracking this as an annotation target um, to be able to catch when people are making normative claims. Another reason why this is important to kind of think more carefully uh, and listen more critically for is that oftentimes we make normative claims in ways that are less than obvious. And the book talks about this uh, a, a little bit for sure. And, and there's a, I don't think it uses this language, but contemporary philosophers who work in ethics like I do oftentimes refer to these things as thick concepts, words and ideas that describe and evaluate simultaneously. And they're very, uh, the book talks about this in the context of spin doctoring, that spin doctoring takes advantage of these uh, normative insinuations uh, or colorings of certain descriptor words. I really like the example the book talks about here with um, the invasion of Iraq versus the liberation of Iraq. Um, those words both do the same descriptive work. They both talk about military operations in Iraq. But they definitely frame them or throw some stank on them that goes in a different direction normatively. Um, invasions are bad. You know, liberations are good, right? It, it kind of already colors how the speaker is going to think about that claim that's being given. Or, or it's going to encourage or insinuate a certain type of evaluative outcome here. So we want to be able to pull those things apart to recognize when that's happening. So when you're doing your annotations for... Um, evaluative terms, and we're going to be uh, annotating E positive, E negative. So E with a plus sign or E with a negative sign here to capture like good versus bad, right versus wrong, things like that, um, to catch the direction of the evaluation. Um, but what you, you're, you're going to have some obvious words here to annotate for, words like good and bad, moral, immoral, just, unjust, things like that. But then you always want to keep your your ears open for these thick concepts, for these words that describe and evaluate, to catch the evaluative component of them. When we actually get into the chapter 5 stuff of putting arguments into standard form, sometimes one sentence is actually encoding two claims, a descriptive claim and a normative claim, and those are logically separate from each other. So when we're putting the argument and, and setting it up in standard form, we'd actually take that one sentence from the passage and put it as two premises, and that would be important for breaking down the logic of the argument. Okay, um, some other sophistications here or um, things to be watching out for. Again, the word bank strategy sucks. Don't use it. And the reason is that we can be using words like good and bad and right and wrong without making normative judgments. And that might sound a little weird, but I think I'll give you an example and it'll clear it up pretty fast. Um, Neil's in the chat here, so I'm going to pick on him again as my example. All right, I'll, I'll pick on my neighbor. Alex here is my neighbor. You're, you're uh, in and around the background. Hey. There's Alex. So let's say I make the claim, Alex thinks Nicolas Cage is a great actor, which I don't know if you think that. I'm probably projecting because that's what I think. But if I make that claim about Alex, I'm just describing what his opinions and beliefs and values are. I'm not making any evaluation of whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, or whether I think Nicolas Cage is a great actor or not. I'm just making a claim about this guy and what he thinks. That's it. So that wouldn't be something to evaluate or annotate here as this is an evaluative judgment. Even though I use the word great, right? That's if I said Nicolas Cage is a great actor, boom, you'd want to circle that and be E positive, right? But if I say it as like Alex believes that Nicolas Cage is a great actor, now you wouldn't annotate that. So the key thing that you're listening for, thanks Alex, yeah. um, I'm using you as a prop. <laughs> um, the key thing that you want to be listening for here 
is that the speaker is committing to a normative judgment, that they're making a normative or evaluative move in the discussion. That's what you want to catch. So all the more reason to use my method of listening for the phenomenon and then finding the language that's responsible for it rather than just doing this mechanical thing of, oh, that's a normative word that's in my normative word bank and so I annotate for it. Um, be, be careful about that. Um, so those are, those are the big things there for evaluative language. Uh, is there anything I'm forgetting? Let me just kind of scan through my lecture notes here. Neil, do you have any questions so far? The stuff I'm saying about um, annotating for evaluative terms making sense? Oh, you think he was good and now he sucks? Oh. Um, That'd be normative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're you're just having a more nuanced view of the normative evaluation of Nicolas Cage as an actor. That he was good at one point and then became not good. Um, I'm not sure I agree with that. I mean, he he definitely has some classic. I think old, old Nicolas Cage has got some very fine performances. Um, there is a recent movie it was done by the guy who did Beyond the Black Rainbow. Uh, what was it called? I think it just had a woman's name as the title. It was like a revenge, psychedelic revenge thriller sort of thing. Like really... <laughs> like Ghost Riders. Ghost Riders. But um, there, this recent film that he was in, um, I haven't watched it. I've just seen some clips of it. But it seems to be like back in... Nicholas Cage wheelhouse. But anyway, this is the tangent. I don't want to get too distracted talking about Nicholas Cage. Um, so, uh, but, 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 yeah, we talked about that. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. I think, I think we're good on this. Um, yeah. Okay, and so you, you don't have any other questions, Neil? All right. So we've got our complete list here of everything we're annotating for, this kind of analytic activity um, as sort of paving the way for doing the chapter five stuff of really reconstructing the argument and painting the portrait of uh, what makes um, the argument what it is in standard form and diagramming. So those things again are argument markers, which include conclusion markers and reason markers. You're gonna fire that up, Alex? Oh, okay. I can I can just pause the video too. Um, so we've got conclusion markers, reason markers, or premise markers. I, and I don't care what how you kind of annotate these things. If you want to do like A M dash C for conclusion marker, argument marker, conclusion. If you want to do A M dash P for premise or R for reason, that's fine. If you want to do C M for conclusion marker. PM for premise marker, RM for reason marker. Whatever way you do it, I'll be able to tell what's up uh, when it comes to like the homework and the exam answers. That's fine. But those are those two types of argument markers we're trying to catch. Assuring, A. Guarding, G. Discounting, D. And then the evaluative stuff, E positive and E negative. Um, that's everything. That's all that I, that I care to discuss. The book talks about uh, rhetorical markers, I'm like, don't bother with that. You might have noticed they're absent from my lecture here. I don't care about the, these sort of marking these rhetorical devices because um, there, there's no pattern. There's no real common pattern to this. Um, it's just a weird potpourri of all sorts of crap, um, and I don't, I don't think it, I, I'm not going to demand that uh, as like something to agonize over trying to capture. Um, it, it's not going to matter too much here. Um, a lot of the rest of the method I'm going to be teaching about how to go about uh, reconstructing the argument in the standard form and diagram won't really make use of that or, or handle the sensitivity for those things automatically anyway. Um, so I'm not worried about it. Um, all the rest of these annotations, though, are all going to be very, very useful in putting together the standard form and diagram stuff. So um, the, the, and as I go through the Chapter 5 material here, I'll try to call back why we cared to pick these things out in the first place. So thinking back to the paper project as a good demonstration of this, um, or actually let me bring up this homework. So uh, Neil, you're not able to see the screen right now, but I'm, I'm pulling up 
um, the homework for chapters three and four. Um, and I'm looking at the one exercise from chapter four at the very end of that assignment that has the equal exchange coffee essay. This is a, a case example I'm going to run with here for the rest of my lectures on three and five. Um, here's a, a passage of argumentative prose. There's like this longer-ish paragraph. And the, the instructions for the homework assignment that you're assigned are to do the annotation project here. So argument markers, assuring, guarding, discounting, evaluative terms, or maybe nothing. Nothing is a possible answer here. Um, but you, you're kind of picking out all these landmarks of what's going on in the argumentative passage. And then you're going to use these as touchstones to, to inform all the judgment calls you're going to have to make on building out the portrait of what the argument actually is that's being expressed in the passage. Uh, like I described in my um, weekend email or uh, video about how you're, or maybe this is in my last video, uh, the, the metaphor of drawing a map. You pick out some major landmarks, and then you fill in all the other details that tie them together, that put them onto one picture, the map itself. Um, so that's what we'll be doing here. Um, and we can go through some examples um, for, yeah, some annotation examples could be useful. I, I'm actually going to skip. I'm going to spoil a couple homework problems just because they're so good. They're such good examples um, to get you sort of calibrated um, for how you apply the theoretical knowledge to what we're going to be doing in the homework, the practical application. So Neil, if you want to follow along with me, do you can you grab the homework exercise scans for chapter three? Cool, awesome. So I'm looking at exercise seven here. Okay. All right. So let's just, let's start. I like one and two quite a lot. They're both really, really good. Um, so while I'm spoiling a little bit of the homework, it should be okay. Um, I think it, they're just so good as illustrations. So the first one says, although no mechanism has been discovered, most researchers in the field agree that smoking greatly increases the chances of heart disease. Now, the way that this homework is set up it has these italicized portions of the sentence with numbers connected with them. And it's asking, it's basically saying like, what is this? Is this anything or nothing? Um, if, if it is something, what is it? This is, again, I've said it before, but it's a good warning. This is not how the exam is going to work. The exam is not going to point your attention at anything. You're going to be, you're going to have to pull these things out of thin air, which is all the more reason why the paper assignment, the paper project assignment is great practice. Um, but let's let's talk about it. So although no mechanism has been discovered, although is discounting. And the way that you can double check that is by uh, identifying, this is the advice I gave before in the lecture, identifying what is the objection being discounted. And the objection that's being discounted here is that there isn't a mechanism that has been discovered for why smoking or how smoking would increase the chances of heart disease. So they're acknowledging a sort of weakness to the position, but saying, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, I know about that, but it doesn't matter. And I'm not telling you why it doesn't matter. I'm just dismissing it, right? No argument, no, no actual argumentative response is being provided, but it is just being dismissed. So that would be discounting. Um, although no mechanism has been discovered, most researchers in the field agree, blah, blah, blah. Most is guarding. Uh, and again, we can kind of double check the answer by asking those those questions I gave you. First, is there a stronger version of the claim that could have been said instead? Oh yeah, definitely. All researchers in the field agree instead of most. That would be much stronger, right? That'd be a bigger claim. Second question, do I think so? Now that the first the answer to the first question was yes, there is a stronger version of the claim that they could have said instead. Do I think the speaker would have wanted to make that claim? Would they have been motivated to make that claim if they thought they could have defended it or gotten away with it? And the answer here is yes, of course, um, because they're appealing to the researchers as an argument from authority, basically, for why you should think smoking, smoking greatly increases the chances of heart disease. Um, so if they were able to say that most researchers 
uh, or that all researchers agree instead of most, that would be even better. I mean, that would be even stronger of a case. It's probably the case then that they are using the weaker version instead of the stronger version because they don't think they can back up or justify the stronger claim. That there's some researcher out there that denies it. Um, maybe backed by big tobacco companies. Um, something like that. All right, so they're just going to guard it a little bit and say most instead of all. So that's guarding. Researchers in the field agree. That's assuring. And it's assuring under the mechanism of making an argument from authority that's sort of half formed. That's not a full full fledged argument from authority. Um, and the and the way you can see that is we don't know who these researchers are. We don't know what research is the basis of that, what their credentials are, any of that. They're just gesturing at an argument from authority instead of actually really making a robust one. So there's nothing here for me to evaluate. I just have to be like, I, okay, I guess you've got some evidence and you're just not sharing it with me now. I don't know what it actually is to be able to evaluate it. So that would be assuring. And then we've got greatly increases the chances of heart disease. This is another case of guarding. And maybe you can probably hear it, that it's like, it's kind of backing off a little bit, a little more hesitant, you know, not as assertive. Um, but again, let's run it through our test. So. Is there a, a stronger version of the claim that they could have said instead? Yeah, yeah. And this one's a little more informal to pick it out, but it's definitely there to be found. Instead of saying smoking greatly increases the chances of heart disease, they could have said that smoking causes heart disease. And that is definitely something that, I, to answer the second question, is there a motive for the speaker to make the stronger claim? Yeah, I mean, most people who want to go down this path are pretty interested in making a causal connection between these two things. It's just, that's a little, causal connections are really hard to prove. Um, but what we can say more definitively is that, well, there's a correlation here, right? The people that smoke ha seem to have higher rates of heart disease. So it increases the chances. It makes it more probable, right? Rather than guaranteeing it or something like that. So that's definitely guarding. Uh, Neil, that's all making sense to you, my explanations? Sweet. Okay. Um, let's do the second one, and, and then this one also has some really cool things to unpack. Um, since, historically, public debt leads to inflation, I maintain that despite recent trends, inflation will return. Um, since here is an argument marker. And we talked about how sense can sometimes be a temporal indicator, but it doesn't make any sense to say in the, like it's a huge distortion of meaning to, to put it like, since the time that historically public debt leads to inflation, uh, that makes no sense. Um, this is an argument marker. It's indicating a support relation. And it's a reason marker because what follows since the, the argument marker is the premise for something else as the conclusion. So you have to do a little identification here of what claim is giving the support, which one is receiving the support, and the historical track record here is the reason for thinking that inflation will return. So this is a reason marker because the claim that follows the argument marker is a premise of the argument instead of the conclusion. So since is a reason marker, historically is really fascinating. Like usually when I do this one in class, I ask people, I'm like, so what do people think this is? You know, I got a whole class of students out there to talk with. I'm like, what do you think this is? And I always get two different answers. And the answer is, it's both. I'm, we've talked before about how uh, with speech acts and conversational acts, a speaker can be performing multiple mo moves at the same time. And since all the things we're annotating for are speech acts or conversational acts, there's nothing stopping something from doing double duty. Um, there is a way in which the word historically is guarding, and there's a way in which it is assuring. Both of those things are happening. Let's talk about them one at a time. First off, it's guarding in the sense that there's a stronger version of the claim they could have said instead. Instead of saying historically public debt leads to inflation, they could have just said public debt leads to inflation as a universal principle, not restricting it to, well, this has been evidenced in the past. Right? They could just say, this is just how it works. But to say this is how it works is a much stronger claim. There's a much higher burden of proof for that than to just say, here's the historical pattern. 
So that's the way in which it's guarding. It's also assuring because what they're doing here, you kind of, if you step back a little bit and just like listen to this, you know, not like picking into the details with a fine tooth comb, but you're just like, okay, what if someone just said this to me? Don't necessarily have my philosophy cap on. Someone just told this to me. You can tell, you can listen and catch that what they're doing is appealing to the historical record as the evidence or the reason for drawing a certain conclusion. So why is that assuring? Well, we don't know what is the historical record that they're using here, right? What are the historical facts that demonstrate the pattern that public debt leads to inflation? Um, this is a gesture at an argument from authority just using the historical record as the authority. So that's the way in which this is also uh, an assuring move too, because we don't have all the details of the argument here to work with. It's not a robust argument that's being presented, but a gesture at one. There's an indication of a more full and complete argument that they have that they're not sharing. Um, does that make sense to you, Neil? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Um, then they got I maintain. And I maintain is assuring here. It's an emphasis of confidence and conviction in the cl uh, of a claim, especially with what follows, where it's like, despite recent trends. Despite is discounting, right? The objection that's being dismissed are the recent trends. So despite is a discounting move here. The I maintain is like, even in the face of objections, I'm sticking to my guns here, right? That's, so that's, an, that's a more deliberate um, an explicit expression of confidence and conviction, and that's another way that assuring happens um, that we talked about before, that if I'm demonstrating or calling attention to my, my confidence and conviction, then this is uh, suggesting through conversational implication that I have some good reason for my confidence um, that, is not, that hasn't been revealed or uh, presented explicitly. So, um, those are exercise seven doesn't ask you to look for um, evaluative terms, so I wouldn't be able to do any demonstration of this. We have a whole exercise here, exercise nine, um, which is all about evaluative, um, positive and negative. It's asking you for descriptive. I'm not going to be asking you for descriptive on the exam for the annotation section there. That would just be like a nothing. Um, anything that's not evaluative, we're going to assume is descriptive. Um, but this is good for first being able to get your listening ear calibrated of of is there is there a normative judgment being made here or not i really like exercise nine because there's some tricky ones on here that's like ah is the speaker committing to this i mean if you start thinking about if you're starting to like calibrate your listening ear for those thick concepts words that have these like suggestive uh, normative implications to them sometimes that can get cranked up a little too sensitively um, Sometimes there are words that we have general normative attitudes associated with that doesn't necessarily mean that the speaker is engaging in a normative evaluation. Um, so it, you kind of need to, when you're listening for, for evaluative terms, this isn't a matter of what you as the analyst think is good and bad or right and wrong. It's you got to be listening for the speaker committing that they're saying this thing is good or bad. Actually, there's a, I forgot to share. There's another little device here that you can use practically for making these judgment calls on the homework and on the exam. If you think that there's an evaluative term happening, positive or negative, just imagine like slipping in, like when you read back the sentence there, it's like blah, 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 and that's a good thing, or and that's a bad thing. Like just make it super explicit and sound if like, is that what they're communicating? You know, are they, would, would that, does that feel natural? Right, that they would, if if they had made that move to be, and that's a good thing and that's a bad thing, they'd be like, yeah, that's that's what they're doing with the language that you've got to analyze. So like, um, uh, Janet is an excellent golfer, and that's a good thing. Right, that makes sense. Right, um, excellent has that kind of normative weight to it. It's it's an evaluation of her golfing abilities, right, and in a positive way, in a positive direction. Um, so you can use that little device to, to double check your evaluative answers too. But there's going to be some goofy ones in here. Um, and again, don't be shy about contacting me to check in about your answers after looking at the, the homework answers I've provided. Okay, um, 
so this is this is all the stuff about um, annotations. Um, transitioning here into the chapter five material, like I I, I kind of jumped ahead, I, I jumped the gun a little bit a while back in talking about how the annotations are are trying to um, set us up for being able to do this more extended argument reconstruction with standard form and diagramming. Um, but let's let's start talking about that. The first thing I want to say is that the method I'm going to teach you for how to do this argument reconstruction is not present in the textbook at all. Um, the the steps that the book presents I don't have a problem with. Um, I think they're all things that uh, you do want to be sensitive to and be tracking while you're um, doing this kind of analysis, doing this argument reconstruction. Um, but I, I don't, well, well, yeah, I'll tell it this way. For one, the steps are not quite as linear as the book may make it seem. It's not like you do step one and then you have to do step two and then step three all the way down. Some of the steps do come before other steps. like. Step one here, <clears throat> my lecture notes are basically a summary of the whole chapter. The first step is to do a close analysis. Um, that just means doing the annotation. That's what the book calls the annotation project, a close analysis. Um, and so you really should be, sorry, here we go. You should be doing that first to pave the way for everything else. Then it says list all explicit premises and the conclusion in standard form. And there's some steps there. And then to clarify. And then to break things up, and then to arrange them in a diagram, and then to check for validity, and then do the suppressed premise thing, which is, we're going to talk a lot about this because this is the trickiest thing. But doing it in that kind of linear fashion just doesn't work. And I know this from experience working with my students. So you are the benefactors of the early classes I taught where students were just like beating their head against this and I was like how can I help my students here like what what is going on um, how can how can I give them some more tools for how to execute on this task like I said the book isn't wrong to be saying here are the steps that you should be sensitive to but the in terms of giving you a procedure or a game plan about how to attack this I, do, I don't think it's so helpful and so I'm going to be supplementing that with um, this thing I call the backwards method. And in the backwards method, you're kind of doing all a lot of these steps simultaneously, which might make it seem like it's more complicated. But again, after years of teaching this with students, it seems to be a far more organic, intuitive, accessible way to do this project. Um, it also is... Uh, some of the things that recommend it uh, are that it really sets students up to naturally dodge a lot of the dangers or traps or mistakes that can be made in this project of uh, doing an improper analysis. And it also, um, I like it because it sort of naturally uh, reveals the argument that is embedded in a passage of argumentative prose that I had a lot of students who were trying to really do this in a mechanical way, and it was backfiring. And if you use my what I'm calling this backwards method that I've created, working with my students, they've been very helpful in developing this whole approach. Um, the, the backwards method is going to, if you're following it right, it's kind of like the argument just reveals itself. It just kind of unfolds before you. And you don't have to force it so much. Let me let me give you a better description of what I mean here. Uh, I'll describe here how um, I've seen students attempt to do this in the past. Um, and 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 by the way, keep in, I'm kind of taking for granted here that you've watched the video from the weekend where I kind of did a sketch of everything that we're doing in these two units that were the, the chapter three and chapter five stuff. So you remember kind of what standard form looks like and what the diagramming looks like. So the standard form has got these numbered points of like this claim, this claim, that line, therefore symbol, conclusion kind of thing. And then you've got the the numbers that are referencing the claims that are in standard form, but with arrows pointing at each other to chart out where the support relations of arguments are. So that's the that's the um, 
those are our paints and canvases. Those are the devices that we've got to work with in doing this, this portrait painting of argument reconstruction. Um, so I'm going to take that for granted here as I describe forward here. But let's go to an example. Um, so this is where I'm going to pull up the Equal Exchange Coffee essay again. Um, pew, there we go. So um, here's a passage of argumentative prose. You do the annotations first. Um, but then, and I'm going to kind of use this as a toy example as we do the Chapter 5 lecture. Uh, we want to capture what is the logic of the argument that's being expressed in this passage. So what what is the conclusion? What are the premises? How many different arguments do we got? Which claims are supporting which other claims? There's going to be a network of arguments. It's not just going to be one argument. It's going to be kind of like a bunch of branches like you saw from the, the weekend video where I, I kind of laid out the paper project thing here. And what students usually have done in the past, before I started doing this whole backwards method thing, is that they basically scan the essay left to right, top to bottom, and kind of pick out all the claims that they hear are being made. So kind of like, imagine going through with like a bucket in a berry field, and just like picking all the berries as you walk down the path, right? So Here's a claim. Oh, well, there's a claim. There's a claim. There's a claim. Until you get through the whole passage. And then it's kind of like you take your bucket of claims, like a bunch of Legos, and just dump them out onto the table. And now you're like, okay, how do I fit all these puzzle pieces together into the argumentative structure of the standard form and diagram? That is a super painful way to go about doing this project. And uh, students are just like so frustrated and trying to do it this way. And even after I've started teaching this backwards method, some students are still like, don't use it <laughs> and try to go through it on their own devices and approach it in this linear fashion, and it really doesn't work. Um, trying to kind of go with a fine tooth comb linearly doesn't make sense. And for one of the big reasons here, why that's the case, is that the argumentative structure of how someone's defending their thesis or their position doesn't necessarily follow the structure of the essay or the English. It doesn't necessarily do that. It's not like all the premises come first and the conclusion is going to be at the end. So you do, you, that's why I like to use this word reconstruction for what we're doing. We, we have to be able to sort out what's the argument, what are, what's going on with the ideas and the words, the English, the language part of it is not sacred here. We don't really care about it. This isn't like um, essay diagramming that you might do for an English class. Um, th there's some systems out there. So not everyone gets taught. It's not universal curriculum. But there's some. maybe some of you have encountered this. You were taught um, some ways of really breaking down uh, language and grammar and paragraphs and stuff like that. That's not what we're doing here. Um, the words are just a vehicle for ideas, and we're interested in the, analyzing the ideas. Um, there may be a bunch of stuff going on in the essay that doesn't have any argumentative function, and so it's not going to get into standard form and diagram. The speaker might even be making claims, but they don't do any argumentative work, so we're just going to leave them out, because that's not what we're analyzing. That, that's a different analytic project. What we're, what we're trying to figure out is, what are the arguments? And the real reason why we're doing all this like the standard form and diagramming is not an arbitrary analytic task. It's not just a hoop to jump through for funsies. Um, the whole point of it is that we're going to get a picture of the argument that is clearer and more accurate, so more de well defined than how it might have shown up when someone was speaking or in how someone was writing. For the purpose of setting up the next stage of the conversation, which is evaluating the argument. So I, I mentioned at the beginning of the quarter that this whole first unit is just about listening. Before we get into the standards for evaluating arguments, first we want to develop the skills and techniques for just figuring out how to listen better. And it all culminates in this chapter here, this chapter five stuff with standard form and diagram. Once we have a nice clean picture of the argument and we can see where all the support relations are, now it becomes much easier and more straightforward to navigate the space of evaluating that. Is this claim true? Is this claim true? Does this support relation hold? Is it a good support relation or a bad one? Like, it's going to be a, a lot more straightforward. Even um, 
and, and we don't always do this. Like, I don't do this. I don't, not every time I'm having a conversation with someone, I'm like, okay, I, I heard your argument. Uh, just give me a second. I'm going to draw some diagrams here, and then we can keep talking. Like, I don't do that. Um, but sometimes I do. Um, it happens all the time at uh, philosophy talks. Like, you go to a, con a philosophy conference, and someone's giving a presentation. If there's, like, a real core argument that we're going to be spending a lot of time debating and discussing, they'll have a little handout, and they'll put an argument in the standard form right there for you and say, here are where the support relations are. And to, to assist the audience in being in a position to be able to criticize them more easily, to be able to evaluate what's going on with that argument for the sake of truth-seeking. So um, that's what this is all about. So that's going to be useful in actually executing on this activity because um, making a super complicated uh, standard form and diagram may not be useful like more is not more sometimes less is more here um, because we want a product here that's manageable and that helps us or assists us in evaluating the argument rather than making it more confusing or harder to get a handle on it um, so keep that in mind here too um, but that's the goal um, for our, our creative efforts here at reconstruction clarity and accuracy is what matters and it's a matter of the ideas and not the language so <clears throat> going back here, fin let me finish off the thread I got running on. Um, the standard way that students used to, or the way it used to happen in the class and the way people have a tendency to do this is this linear top to bottom, left to right, gather all the claims, dump them out, and now try to arrange them into a tree, into a structure that seems to make sense. And oftentimes a lot of stuff gets misrepresented um, or there's a lot of lack of clarity that shows up in doing it that way and just frustration and pain and agony. So how is my backwards method different? What, I, what are you supposed to be doing instead? <clears throat> well, it all comes to the name of it. I call it the backwards method because what we're going to do is start with identifying the conclusion. So uh, here, I'm gonna, I got a little a Microsoft Paint thing I'm going to pull up here. Uh, I can use as like a whiteboard, but uh, Neil, if you're in chat here, you're not seeing what I'm what I've got on my screen, but you can kind of remember that um, picture I drew uh, for the weekend lecture where I showed a diagram with the numbers and the arrows. You remember that? I actually um, I put it as an attachment on the. Uh, where I posted the video on Canvas too, uh, because the 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 webcam got put in the wrong spot and was covering up part of the diagram, so um, so I wanted to change that, uh, so you'd have something to follow along with. Um, that was uh, I want to say Saturday. I think it was Saturday. It should also be here. I can actually pull up the modules. Um, if you go to the page that says 713 supplement video for writing project, you'll find the link to the video. And uh, there's a, a file that I've just plugged in right there um, that you can download. Cool. So that picture will more or less correspond with what I got going on here that I'm drawing on the screen for everyone on YouTube later here. Okay, so here's an example diagram that I've got. Actually, let me try to make it exactly like the one you're looking at, Neil. That would be helpful, huh? Maybe I'll just pull it up. I want to make sure I, I didn't draw a different one than what you're looking at. Because arguments can take all sorts of different shapes and forms to them. Um, here we go. Loading. Oh, poor computer. You're so old. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I roughly did this the same. All right. So you see uh, the diagram has one at the bottom, two with an arrow pointing at one, three plus four together pointing at one, and 5 is pointing at 4.
Yeah, that's right. Cool. So I'll just be using that as like a toy example here uh, to talk through. So if you're looking at a passage like the Equal Exchange Coffee essay, my technique starts with, it, it's kind of doing standard form and diagram simultaneously rather than as separate steps the way the book sort of presents it. Um, imagine uh, that, well, you're just scanning the whole passage. You're looking at the whole essay. Look at the forest level. Like, overall picture, what's the point? What's the bottom line that the speaker is trying to argue for? What's their ultimate conclusion? And while well, I got you on the line here, Neil, um, when you're looking at that equal exchange coffee essay, what do you what do you think is the conclusion? What do you think they're trying to convince the audience of? Number one? Yeah, yeah, the kind of ultimate conclusion of the whole thing. What would it be? No, 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 no. The numbers are for annotation. Uh, just forget like the numbers exist and look at the whole paragraph. It may be a little early in the morning to bring this up, but if you buy coffee from large corporations, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I'm talking, going back to the homework exercises for chapter three and four. Um, there's that, uh, the last exercise in that homework batch uh, is this paragraph that is asking you to do annotations, basically. But I'm going to be using it also as an example here for standard form and diagramming. Um, okay. So, you know, just take a, a second here to scan through the paragraph and see if you can pick out what, what your intuitive ear tells you is what the speaker is trying to argue for. And while you're doing that, I will actually take this moment to not forget to give out the code for this video. Um, and since I've been drinking some jasmine green tea, let's have jasmine be the code word for the video today. Jasmine is the code word. Jasmine. I don't I think this is a very important idea for their argument but I don't think it's the ultimate conclusion of what they're trying to prove um, this seems to be a premise rather than the, the 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 sort of a claim that's providing support for some other claim rather than the claim that's receiving all the support from all the other claims of what they're bringing up Nope, uh, that's about conditional statements, and conditionals are not arguments. Yep. Kind of just think, uh, just kind of, you know, uh, squint your eyes a little bit. Don't get so focused on the details. And just be like, what is this person trying to convince me of? Or, and this is no pun intended here, but what are they selling me? You know, what, are, what is the, the ultimate conclusion they're hoping that I can, that I will draw based on all the arguments and reasons that they're throwing down. Yeah, I, I just put it as, you should buy equal exchange coffee. That's a claim. It could be true or false. Maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. But what they're trying to justify is that. So the, the one weakness of my backwards method is that at, for this method to work, everything hinges on picking out the right conclusion. But that's going to provide the guide for determining everything else about how these arguments work. So looking back to that little uh, example of what an argument diagram would look like with all the arrows and numbers and things, Neil, um, the, well, where, Shoo. let me pull it up. There it is. 
the ultimate conclusion of the entire passage would be claim number one. It's kind of where the buck stops. All the arrows flow to it. All the support is culminating in that claim. That's the conclusion claim of the entire passage. And there might be other arguments that are embedded in there, sub-arguments, like in the diagram, 4 is receiving support from 5. So there's an argument with 5 as a premise and 4 as a conclusion. But that support for 4, 4 is ultimately being used as part of an argument to defend 1. So the way the backwards method works is by starting at the end of the story, figuring out what's the ultimate point, what's like the thesis of the passage, what's the, not the main theme, so to speak, but it's sort of like the bottom line argumentatively. What's the thing that the speaker is trying to convince you of, um, the ultimate target for justification, um, the thing that is trying to be rationally justified? That's the step one of my method, is to pick that thing out. Um, is this is this feeling feeling good, Neil? Well, yeah, I mean, this kind of is like an advertisement. Advertisements are arguments, actually. Um, and it's a uh, it's actually uh, just talking a lot about advertising and business ethics last quarter. Um, and advertisements use a lot of different languages. They don't just use the language of English words, for instance, or of natural language words. Um, but like we were talking about with chapter two, like there's lots of linguistic systems out there and not all of them are natural languages. Um, the language of imagery is really powerful. Um, but at all advertisements are really implicit arguments trying to convince you of the conclusion you should buy their product. So that can be a conclusion. Um, <clears throat> even if someone's not doing an advertisement, though, or trying to literally sell you something, you can still use that metaphor of what is this person trying to sell me on at, to like as a maybe a useful heuristic for finding out what the conclusion is. Um, like asking yourself that question in the passage that you're asked to analyze. Like, what are, what are they trying to convince me of? What are they trying to justify? What's their What's their position? Where are they planting a flag here that then they're trying to give argument to defend? So that's that's feel, this is feeling good. Cool. Sorry, I have to lean on you so much, Neil, but you've been the only one here for the last couple lectures, so I appreciate you being here, um, as always. Yeah. So step one of the backwards method, uh, and well, the whole backwards method is sort of building out standard form and the diagram simultaneously. So this would start with picking out the ultimate conclusion, and Neil, I can describe what I'm drawing on the screen here on my whiteboard, but I, I would have this um, triforce symbol, I would have a number one, and then I'd list the claim that is the conclusion, so I'd spell that out as best I can here, as uh, you should buy equal exchange copy. All right, there we go. And then I will draw a line above it to show that there's an inference that's being made. And let me add the little Triforce symbol next to that conclusion claim so we know, we know it is a conclusion. And now we're ready to do the next step. Um, so you're kind of uh, locating where things are in the structure of the argument and then trying to pin them down. And again, uh, you should buy equal exchange coffee is language that never shows up in the essay. But this is what I've been referring to before as your artistic license. You're allowed to re-articulate the point or the idea. You don't have to use a copy-paste method with the text that you're being given to analyze. If you think the language in the essay is good enough, like it gets the point across absolutely clearly, um, then it's fine to use the speaker's language. Uh, we're definitely going to be worried about putting words in people's mouths that they don't necessarily mean or projecting meaning that isn't actually there. Um, but there's no problem with rewording something if you think you can do a better job of drawing out what the idea is. So I think that's the case here. Like the real, po the real point of the essay is you should buy equal exchange coffee. Um, that's that's the whole whole game, 
and it never is said exactly that way in the essay, but that's fine. It's the ideas are definitely present there. This idea is definitely present there. So I'm I'm exerting my my artistic license and um, rephrasing this claim as it appears in standard form, and then starting out on my diagram. So at this point, actually, if you imagine all I've really done is put down the number one to start the diagram, and then over in standard form, I've cashed out what claim one stands for. You should buy equal exchange coffee. The next step of the backwards method is to trace the lines of support back. So in the case of this essay, the first thing I would do is, again, scan the entire essay holistically. I'm not going left to right, top to bottom. A conclusion claim sh could show up at the beginning of the essay. It could show up in the middle. It could show up at the end. It could be anywhere. The arguments that are being used to defend that thesis, um, that conclusion claim, they could show up anywhere too. So I want to kind of, first off, uh, and this is another part of my advice to all of you, is you know, don't go straight into pinning down the exact details. Kind of get the feel for it first, kind of informally first, and then zero in on it. So the first thing I think about here after I've got the conclusion nailed down is like looking at the whole passage, what are the kinds of argumentative appeals that the person is making? Like something over here, maybe something over here, something over here. So when I'm looking at this essay, I'm like, well, there's something about large corporations. They're kind of making an argument about large corporations. They don't need your money, something like that, the lining the pocket stuff. There's definitely some stuff here about what happens with small farmers that they're appealing to is like a reason to buy the coffee. And then they're, they're also talking about it being gourmet and all this sort of stuff. <clears throat> and I'm talking intentionally in a kind of informal way. They're talking about this. They're talking about just kind of getting the ballpark first. Um, if I was drawing this on a whiteboard right now, um, Neil, you'd see me do uh, drawing like arrows that are pointing at one. Um, but then just kind of drawing these squiggles of like, I don't know exactly how I'm going to pin out those claims just yet. But uh, there's something over here and something over here. You kind of just get in the ballpark first. And once you've figured that out, like, what are all of the appeals that the speaker is using to kind of go after this conclusion directly, then you can start thinking about articulating them more precisely, assigning numbers to them, and building out the standard form in the diagram more from there. Okay, so one argument here, we, let's do the low-hanging fruit. One thing that they're appealing to is that it's gourmet coffee. And what's the point? Like, what's the actual argument there? What's the premise that would justify the conclusion that you should buy the coffee? Well, it's as simple as it tastes good. That's it, right? I mean, we can be blunt here. We don't have to get fancy and intellectual about it. We can just say, you know, claim number two. I'll put this above claim number one in standard form because it's a premise supporting one as a conclusion. Just say equal exchange coffee tastes good. And um, that's it, and we're good. I can uh, now fill out one of my uh, like sloppy bubbles I just put in there provisionally, and we can drop in two pointing at one. And there we go. We're off to the races. Um, in fleshing out a little bit more of the picture of how this standard form and diagram is going to look. Neil, are you able to follow with my verbal descriptions of what I'm doing? Yeah. Okay. So what you're seeing in the in the painting uh, uh, the paint document from Canvas is a standard form with a bunch of squiggles. So just imagine that like claim one says you should buy equal exchange coffee, and then above it is claim two, which says equal exchange coffee tastes good. Nope. That's all part eva of evaluation. Right now, we're just like, what is the argument? Some of the arguments might be good, some of them might suck. When you're working on your own paper assignment, I don't want you being like, oh, now that I'm actually analyzing my essay, I'm like, this is a bad argument. Let me fix it in standard form. No. You want your standard form to be an accurate depiction of the arguments that are present in that essay that you wrote, even if they suck. 
If they suck, they suck. But they are what they are. And that's what we first want to listen for. Just make sure we've got it right. Okay. Um, we could, I, I, I might in the next video, this video is starting to get, you know, past the two hour mark here. So I might shut this down soon. But when I do the follow up lecture, um, which I might do something this weekend or maybe next Tuesday, I'm still thinking about it. I'll let you know. But um, when we finish up the chapter five lecture here, as I go further with this, I'll probably work with the equal change coffee essay a little bit more in detail. Um, but I, you know, the other arguments that the essay is presenting are more complicated than this. You should buy equal exchange coffee because it tastes good kind of thing. You know, especially the stuff about uh, how it helps small farmers. There's a lot of little details of like how economics works that they're appealing to to get that pinned down. And it might take some careful thinking to pick your, pick out all the claims that are involved in making that argument tick. But the 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 basic overview vision here is again first. Figure out the main conclusion. Second, once you got that articulated and pinned down, look over the whole essay organically and ask, what is the speaker doing to support that conclusion claim? What are the appeals that they're making? And first, just try to get a fuzzy general beat on them. Then isolate them one by one and start pinning them down in detail. And then after you've done that, after you've done kind of the first level here of arrows pointing at one, however many of those there are, then start looking at all the claims that were the premises and asking, is somewhere in this essay, did they ever defend that claim? So when they say equal exchange coffee tastes good, did they offer anything in defense of that claim and try to work out where these sub arguments might be, um, where there's going to be uh, arrows pointing to the numbers that were premises that were pointing to the conclusion. Um, whether I can start, I can draw this a little bit while I'm talking. So like I've got two supporting one. Is there an arrow pointing at two? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. If there is, you want to capture it. Um, maybe there's some other claim here. We'll call it claim six supports claim two. So once you got the first line or the first wave of primary arguments supporting the conclusion, then look and see if they give any sub arguments, secondary arguments defending the claims that were the premises of those main arguments. Um, and in this way, you'll sort of naturally uh, reveal the whole structure of the argument that's in that passage. Um, and the where each claim is supposed to be found in the tree of the diagram will kind of be revealed more organically and more naturally. And you're not going to have to force it. It's not like when you've got all those puzzle pieces out on the table in front of you and you're trying them out. What if do these fit together? Do these fit together? You don't have to do that experimentation with it. Um, if you're just listening for the speaker and their intentions here, that they're like, this is because of this and that is because of that. And the, the whole structure will just kind of blossom like a flower in front of you. Uh, or at least that's the, that's the idea. That's the, the theoretical dream. There's still going to be plenty of stuff to struggle with, and there's a bunch of little details here um, that are the things that the book is talking about in this section that are very important to be tracking um, in terms of executing on how do you use this judgment call of your artistic license. Um, suppressed premises we're going to have to talk about a lot. These hidden premises, unspoken claims that are actually in the argument and need to get into standard form and diagram, even though they never show up in the passage that you're analyzing. It's very easy to get paranoid about those. I'm going to have a lot of advice about all that. But I, I think this gets us a start here on Chapter 5 and um, and a little bit of how it's connected with um, the annotations. Um, here's one little demonstration, and we'll pick up and do more of this next time. But look at the argument that we, as far as we've gotten with our analysis of the Equal Exchange Coffee essay so far, uh, just even in its humble beginnings. C main conclusion? You should buy equal exchange coffee. Um, argument, premise, equal exchange coffee tastes good. Um, notice the conclusion is normative. It's about what you should do. It's not a descriptive claim. Should, should not, ought, ought not. Those would be evaluative terms that we would want to be annotating for. And if you've got a normative conclusion, based on what we were saying earlier about the is-ought gap, we, need, we know that we need to have at least one normative premise. And to say equal exchange coffee tastes good fits the bill.
because tasting good, that's E positive right there. We'd annotate for that. So we're like, cool, I'm feeling really good about this. You should buy equal exchange coffee. Why? Because it tastes good. No gap in the logic here. So we're kind of done. If there was uh, just a descriptive claim going on, though, this would be there'd be there'd be a weird gap here. There'd be a logical gap between the premises and the conclusion that we'd need to fill. Kind of like in that argumentative example I gave before about um, you know me talking with my son about hitting his cousin. If I just tell him, if I gave him the argument, hitting is wrong because hitting causes pain. There's a hidden suppressed premise in there that's needed to make that logic work, that causing pain is wrong. And that's that's a little glimpse of the kind of thinking we have to do reflectively in interpreting the argumentative passages that we're given to analyze um, for these suppressed premises, for these hidden premises. It's going to be provoked by seeing, whoa, there's a big leap in logic here, but I can use some charity on behalf of the person I'm listening to to be like, I think they probably are, have this claim in mind as, as a hidden assumption that's being taken for granted. I, if I give you that argument, I'm sure you'd think, yeah, that sounds good. That hitting causes pain is a great reason not to hit people or to think hitting is wrong, right? But you're also just taking for granted that same underlying assumption that maybe goes without saying, or we might think that, that causing pain is wrong. So um, we'll, we'll be doing that kind of thing to try to reveal the underlying logic of what someone is offering in these argumentative passages. But I think that's a good place to, to cut us off. Um, Neil, how are you feeling? Uh, one last check-in with you here about the, the setup here for Chapter 5 and the general principles of my backwards method as a way to execute on, on doing the standard form diagram. Are there any... Uh, I'm sure there are some questions about where is this all going, and we're going to talk more about it in the upcoming lecture, but um, do you have any questions that you'd want to ask right now that I could help with clarifying? Okay. And normative premises are not the only kinds of hidden suppressed premises that show up. But they are the most common and the ones that I, I think are most important to catch. Uh, and I'll talk about that more in my next lecture. Uh, there will be a lot of details I'll be providing about. Like suppressed premises are the, the hidden premises. are the, That's the hardest part of this whole project. Um, so I'll be giving a lot of advice about that. Yeah, nomological is a very different sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that you can't think of any other questions off the top of your head? This has all been going down smooth? Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, and if, for any of you on YouTube watching this later, if there's some part of this lecture that's confusing or didn't quite click for you, um, call me up as a replacement for you being able to be here and ask questions on the fly. Um, I try to anticipate as many as I can, but I never catch them all. So help me with that. Help me know to help you. <laughs> That's guess what I'm saying. All right. Uh, until next time then, uh, stay tuned for my weekend update email probably tomorrow, and I'll, I'll be making a judgment call by then about whether I'm going to record another supplement video this weekend. Um, but, you know, four hours of lecture roughly a week is not quite enough to keep us on pace for summer schedule, I think. Um, and I've also been thinking about doing a supplement video to just talk through more problems, uh, kind of review some more problems from Chapter 2, the Chapter 2 homework, maybe for some of the, the ones coming down the pipe, too. Um, I've given out my homework answers, but uh, you know, people have definitely remarked that when I talk it through, it helps a lot. So, like when I did that in the last video where I, I walked through that doctor case, uh, I had a few people who were texting me and being like, that really helped me. Um, so maybe I'll do some more of that. But again, no one is posting anything on the discussion boards of where I'm like, here's a discussion forum for you to ask questions about the homework. If you just want to maybe, so this is a request I'll make. Uh, if people would just, um, maybe in the next day or so, uh, post 
um, just what problem you would like me to review in a video. If you just make requests, I'll take your requests and talk about which problems you want to do. If this was a live class in the classroom, that's what I'd be doing. I'd have a homework day where I just show up and I'm like, which problems do you want to talk about? And people put some on the menu and then we knock them out and, and talk them over, talk them through. So why don't, why don't we do that? In the absence of no one sort of seeming to take my invitation to ask specific questions about homework problems, then maybe just put a post on there if you're like, I was confused by this one. Or your answer to this one isn't making sense to me. Or I see what you did there, but I don't know how I would have caught that. Or do you have advice about this? Or is my this other answer right or anything like that just you can just make even really simple requests and I'll, I'll try to knock those out in a video I think I think that could even a, I'll just make a short one and I can help a little bit more that might be another way to get some feedback from me for this class and using the homework to prepare you for the exam so I'll make that request um, let's give that a shot and see if, if we can get people to post some stuff and see if that can work um, okay anything else you want to ask Neil before we sign off here All right, cool. Then so long to you and so long to all of you on YouTube. I'll see you next time.